You're watching KLTX, Channel 15, serving the city of Lufkin. Cats, dogs, tigers, jaguars, and rhinos. Between the Winnie Berry Humane Society and the Ellen Trout Zoo, we brave the cute and cuddly to the ferocious to bring you the latest in animal news from Lufkin. It's summer and one of the busiest travel times of the year. Area law enforcement officers are reminding motorists to play it safe and buckle their seatbelt. It's all part of the Click It or Ticket campaign to save lives. And it's heating up in East Texas. We will offer a few reminders on how to play it safe this summer. everyone, I'm Yana Ogletree and welcome to the July edition of City Hall Update. Zoo Safari is in full swing at the Ellen Trout Zoo. Kids from first through sixth grades are attending classes that teach them about wildlife and how to care for the animals living at the zoo. As part of the class, several groups of children put their creativity skills to work to witness the predator instincts of the large cats. Both the tiger and the jaguar were treated to these mock animals that had been filled with raw meat scent. Both the kids and big cats alike seem to enjoy the project. The Ellen Trout Zoo just recently had some visitors from several other zoos, including Houston, Dallas, and San Diego, but it wasn't a social call. All of the participants are part of the SSP, or Species Survival Plan. Conservationists also working together to ensure the continuation of a viable population of endangered animals in their care. Over 100 different species are covered by various SSP programs, including the white rhino. We had uh, San Diego Zoo Global, is the, or the, the uh, San Diego Zoo Safari Park is part of San Diego Zoo Global. They sent a team uh, of veterinarians and of uh, uh, researchers to uh, do the work. Then Houston Zoo sent a veterinarian and a vet tech, and the Dallas Zoo sent a veterinarian. And each of these uh, three zoos that came in brought specialized equipment to participate in this. So nope. we were pretty excited about the opportunity to work with those. Uh, we, of course, want to have white rhinos born here the natural way, and, and uh, records indicate that yesterday they were endeavoring to do that. But this is a, also a way of producing more white rhinos by uh, artificial insemination. And they've already uh, are looking at 
doing one of the uh, females in San Diego Zoo. So some of the the efforts that have gone through here may be paying off, you know, the normal gestation period of a rhino. During the actual procedure in in the the rhino building, in a stall adjacent to the one where the procedure was being done, they had, had set up a lab so that they could be working their equipment while the rhino was down. And it, it worked out very well. The, uh, we anticipated the procedure to run about two hours and ran around 45 minutes. And so it went very quick. He got uh, the reversal uh, medications, he got up, he, he wandered around, he was, we kept him in close quarters the rest of the day just to make sure because sometimes some of those uh, uh, sedatives have rebound effects and we could have, have him go down again later in the day, but that did not happen. And uh, then the next day he was back out on exhibit with Patty and they've been very happy ever since. Okay. Well, one of the things that is significant about this is that uh, we have two rhinos. We have uh, Boana here and we have Stormy that's in uh, North Carolina. And both of these rhinos are very underrepresented genetically, and so they're very valuable. And they will be going to the North Carolina Zoo and doing the same thing with our rhino over there. And it's exciting to be a part of trying to keep endangered species actually going and alive and, and be able to uh, participate and, and be involved in the action as, uh, uh, in addition to being able to uh, do environmental education and try to let everybody know how bad uh, rhinos are in, uh, in uh, the wild. So they have the resources and they have the manpower and they financed everything. And so it just was a win-win thing for everybody. They wanted specimens from our rhinos and we wanted to be able to participate in this big conservation program. And uh, it just was perfect. Because we don't want rhinos to go extinct. I mean, it's, it's hard to imagine as, if you've lived your whole life and you've been familiar with rhinos and then to think one day they're not going to be here. That's kind of tough. And so we want our rhinos, uh, Boana and Patty, to be representative to our guests so they, they can see the rhinos. They know what they look like. They know what they move. They can see the size and... and then if they hear about rhinos that uh, need some help, they're better prepared to, to go to the aid. And so we do that every day. And uh, we do this when we have the opportunity to do the procedures with the, the team whenever we have the opportunity. What, what San Diego Zoo did was contact the, the rhino SSP coordinator who ha actually happens to be in Texas when, at the Fossil Rim uh, Wildlife Center there and said this is a thing that we would like to participate. We, would, we want the SSP's endorsement and we will work with SSP recommendations to uh, make sure that this material gets to genetically uh, appropriate individuals. Then the SSP reviews that proposal and got back with them and said, yes, we endorse this. We're, we're behind you 100%. So when they came here, and, and got specimens from Buana, they can't uh, independently decide what they're gonna do with them. They have to have, in, in, in Buana's case, he's actually owned by the Gladys Porter Zoo in Brownsville. So they have to have Gladys Porter's permission. They had to have our permission to do this procedure. And then they have to have the SSP recommendations on how to utilize the material they collected. When they go to North Carolina Zoo, they once again, they'll have to have our permission. They'll have to have North Carolina Zoo permission to, to uh, perform the procedure at that facility. Then the SSP recommendations, and then they have to contact us and make sure that we're okay. There are times in which uh, there are reasons for zoos not to follow SSP recommendations. And it's not very often, and they're very, you know, unique and unusual circumstances, but uh, there is occasion that that happens. And so the owning 
zoo has to authorize that as well. Uh, I don't think there would be anything that uh, would be proposed by San Diego Zoo that we wouldn't be happy to be part of. We're happy to be involved in this conservation effort with the white rhino, and it's just one more way that we have to be involved in conservation activities for wildlife. Uh, our, probably our biggest and most uh, famous program is with the Louisiana pine snake, and uh, we're in the, in the process now. After the physical year for the Memphis Zoo starts, which is July the 1st, we will be receiving funds to get into a remodel of our current facility and uh, new equipment and potentially be able to hire a couple of other people who will do nothing but work with these pine snakes. And we believe that within the next year or two, we will be at our goal of having 100 snakes and be ready then to be trying to locate a place in Texas that we can release them. And, and participating in this program, already we're releasing Louisiana snakes in central Louisiana in the national forests over there. And the, the Louisiana pine snake is important for the Ellen Trout Zoo because it used to occur in Angelina County. And we're the only zoo that's participating that's in, within the historic range of the snake. And so it's a harmless snake. It, it won't hurt anybody. It eats rodents and it helps uh, play a critical role in that longleaf pine habitat. And we're able to really take action. We, we can breed the animals here and have animals to put back into the wild. And that's really what SSP is there all about, is just trying to uh, have animals that are suitable for release when and if habitat becomes available. Some of the larger ones, it becomes difficult. Tigers, there's a lot of human-tiger conflicts and there's a lot of things that have to be sorted out with, with something like that. But the pine snake is, is something that's relatively simple to do with the right partners. And uh, so we're excited about that. I'd like to welcome Steve Davidson. He's the president and CEO of the Boys and Girls Club of Deep East Texas to our show. And some exciting things going on year round at the Boys and Girls Club, but we're approaching some major fundraisers for the club that actually helps keep the club operating and being able to provide a lot of benefits to the youth of East Texas. Welcome to the Thank show. Thank you. It's glad to have you on the show. I think you've, you told me earlier you've been in your position about a year now. Yes, ma'am. So um, I'd like to let's talk a little bit about, about your background before sure. we sure. move forward with some of the events coming up. Um, so, because I don't think we've had you on the show. Uh, I'm not. Yeah. So this thank is you real, so much for inviting me. This is a real treat. Tell me about your background. Uh, you're no stranger to um, Boys and Girls Club organizations, are you? No, I'm not. Um, I've been working for the Boys and Girls Club just about almost 38 years. Uh, I went to college in Arizona at Arizona State University, and I actually started working for the Boys and Girls Club part time uh, when I was in college. And then my first full time job out of college was for a Boys and Girls Club in. Uh, Phoenix, Arizona, uh, and then I was in Scottsdale, Arizona for 23 years, uh, the last eight years there as their CEO, and then a friend of mine was uh, merging two Boys and Girls Clubs in Southern Nevada, the Boys Club, Boys and Girls Clubs of Henderson and Boys and Girls Clubs of Las Vegas to become the Boys and Girls Clubs of Southern Nevada, uh, and he asked me to come up there, and I was looking for a change to be their chief operating officer because they had kind of different philosophies between the two organizations. Uh, so I went up there to help him with that process. And I was up there for about two years. Uh, and at that point, my wife said, you know what, we really want to kind of find a smaller Boys and Girls Club, a smaller community uh, that we could go and live in and, and really enjoy and be part of the community. And uh, unfortunately, because of the passing of Jeff Woods, uh, this position became available and, and uh, fortunate enough to be here. All right, so you are the second president and CEO of the Boys and Girls Club of DV East Texas. That's correct. So Jeff was the original yeah. one and was here just about 25 years. Yeah, so that's that's incredible, you know, that y you would be the second. You know, you think of a, a organization such as Boys and Girls Club, you would have, you know, many people passing through, but, but you don't. And I think that makes the club a huge success. 
um, you know, that there there is a strong foundation that was created 25 plus years ago mm-hmm. um, by Jeff Woods and those involved, uh, Murphy George. Yes. Uh, you can't, I mean, you can't think of Boys and Girls Club without thinking about Murphy, Murphy George. That's correct. So, That's correct. And, such and, a, and actually what we did, um, you know, we wanted to make sure that uh, having kind of a new generation uh, in the organization, we wanted to make sure that we always maintain that history of the organization. So, mm-hmm. That's so uh, we, es- we established a Hall of Fame for the Boys and Girls Club of Deep East Texas, and Murphy George was in our first class of inductees. Uh, a big honor, but uh, somebody who was uh, very important to the history of this organization. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay, so let's talk about, uh, we're glad you're here. Thank you. First of all, thank you. But let's talk about Black Tie Bingo. We all know that Black Tie Bingo is synonymous with the Boys and Girls Club of Deep East Texas. There are many of them in the, the communities that are served by Boys and Girls Club. Uh, tell me about this event. Sure. Uh, you know, it's funny because um, when we did the event last year, it was kind of the, the mixing of a lot of different things going on. Uh, that afternoon was when the uh, Lufkin Little League won the uh, United States Championship. So we had that going on. Uh, there was a major fight, and it was the beginning of Hurricane Harvey. So we had all of these things going on simultaneously, uh, but still had over 400 people attend the event last year. We had 50-some tables. Uh, it's a lot of different things that are going on during the course of the evening. Uh, we do a silent auction and a live auction. Uh, we do a, des- uh, a dessert raffle, uh, as well as a raffle of different items that you can purchase tickets for. Uh, we also have a raffle going on right now for a Gucci purse. Uh, and then also um, uh, we play bingo. And so, that's a lot of fun. You yeah, can't it is go a lot wrong of fun. with bingo, right? <laughs> no, no. Everybody enjoys and that. And desserts. <laughs> and desserts, exactly. So the desserts are fun because usually what it'll do is, is somebody will buy the dessert uh, and basically buy it for their table yeah. and kind of split it amongst everybody. And so who makes all these desserts? You know, they're made by, um, by some companies here, some bakeries here in town, uh, but they're actually made by a lot of individuals mm-hmm. who just want to contribute and, and be part of the event, and it's their way to contribute to the club. And what do you hope to raise? What is your goal? Uh, my goal this year is to hopefully raise $100,000. From one black tie event or all of them? No, from just the one black just tie one event here in Lufkin. Yes, Lufkin ma'am. Lufkin one, okay. Um, so, in t- so give me the logistics of it. What, you know, when is it? Where is it? Sure. What do you wear? You know? It's August 25th. Um, and it's uh, kind of a, uh, the theme is kind of a, um, a wine tasting type of uh, event. Uh, so it's uh, kind of a casual, not casual, but more of a cocktail type of uh, attire uh, for the event. Uh, it's at Pitzer Garrison. Uh, the event starts at 6 p.m. Uh, and will be done probably around 9.30. Uh, tables are available. Uh, a table of eight is $700. Uh, or you can buy individual tickets for $80, and that includes your bingo cards. Uh, and we do have sponsorships available too as well. All right, and so what, what are you playing for in bingo? What kind of prizes do you have? Oh, um, last year we had, uh, we had some gift cards, like $250 gift cards. Uh, we had a, um, I, f- I shouldn't say an iPhone, an iWatch. Mm-hmm. Is that what they call them, iWatches? Yeah, an Apple Watch. Apple Watch, thank you. Uh, we had big screen TVs, so some real fun things. Yeah, so, some great things. Yeah. So, how many tickets do you plan on selling? Uh, we expect to sell probably between uh, 50 and 55 tables. Okay, that's so a lot a of tables. So, a little 400. Yeah. Yeah, but what we're going to do is we're going to, like for some of the raffles, uh, like the Gucci uh, purse, we're going to limit the amount of tickets that we're going to sell uh, to make it more um, appealing for people to buy tickets. Okay. Any other events you would like to talk about that's coming up? You know, that's, you. that's our big event. Yeah. Um, Ironically, uh, we have a black tie bingo the week before in Nacogdoches. Uh, that's uh, another big event that we hope to raise about the same amount of money. Yeah, and yeah, you, you do those black tie bingos in all of the cities basically that you serve. That's you? correct. Yeah, so uh, you should be able to do this with your eyes closed. You know. Well, you know, black tie bingo <laughs> was actually something that uh, was kind of new to me uh, uh, that when I came here last year and stuff like that. But they're they're very enjoyable. Everybody really does have a great time. Okay. And if you'd like more information on Black Tie Bingo, how can you get that? You know, you can go to our website, 
uh, which is www.bgcdet.org. And you can find information on our website. Can you actually buy tickets online? or You can. Oh, okay, that's great. Yes, you can. Okay. All right, so it's Black Tie Bingo, uh, sponsored by... The Boys and Girls Club of Deep East Texas. It's August the 25th at the Pitzer Garrison Civic Center. Unlike some of the past years, it's been really casual. So it sounds like this year is a little bit more formal cocktail. Uh, yeah, but not not formal. Not formal, formal but not, not shorts. No, you know. And when when the idea, uh, what I was told was when the idea uh, came up of the black tie bingo, it was a very very formal. It was actually a black tie. Yes, it was uh, okay. event um, with the idea of. Um, uh, the woman who came up with the idea actually said, well, let's try to merge two things. Women love to dress up and men like to gamble. So, so let's, <laughs> have a a form, let's have a formal bingo yeah. event. So. Okay, so, you know, in, in the past, it's kind of been, it's kind of ventured off into beach wear, like mm-hmm. shorts and flowery shirts. But so this year, um, make sure you check uh, the attire. Uh, before you go, but uh, with some wine tasting, uh, lots of uh, auctions and raffles and fun bingos. So um, check it out. Go to the Boys and Girls Club of Deep East Texas website, learn more information and buy tickets. Steve, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you for joining us and best of luck with Black Tie Bingo. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. The Angelini Community Theater recently held its annual Kids Act Camp. Every weekday, nearly all day, for two weeks, the volunteers, staff, and board members spent time teaching the young campers all aspects of theater production, from acting, makeup, and set design, to blocking and lighting. These lessons serve as a foundation to the camp's grand finale, a full theater production presented to family and friends. This year's production, The Little Mermaid Junior, was a big hit and enjoyed by all. This is our third year to have our children's camp, and the focus is to have some acting classes, tech classes, as well as to give the students a performance opportunity so that they can grow their own performance skills. And so we have done a musical, and this is our third year for doing a musical. This year we're doing The Little Mermaid Junior, and we have around 27 or 28 students here. And many of them, uh, their coming is made possible by uh, a memoriam scholarship. This is the first year that we've had it. Uh, a good friend, uh, she was from Lufkin High School, graduated in, I believe, 1987. And she passed away this last year from cancer. And many of her friends from the Lufkin area and Austin, where she taught, and all over, uh, donated to this scholarship fund and they use that scholarship for the students. They collected enough scholarships that we could do partial and a few full scholarships this year and next year as well for two years. So we're really excited about that. That was one of the things with Camp Center Stage with the Angelina Arts Alliance, which uh, quite a few of us that are working this camp were allied with that when it was uh, when it was in being, and um, we were able to offer scholarships through Temple uh, Memorial, and so now we're able to do with this scholarship as well, and so that has enabled uh, students that might not have been able to come to do it, and so we've got community people who are here working. That's part of community theater is that it's low local people helping give back. And so we have that going. We have students from Dieball, students from uh, Lufkin, uh, students from, um, and Lufkin being Lufkin area, and um, Huntington and Hudson are all here. So we, we really do have a wide variety of Angelina County students that are here learning and having a good time. My high school theater teacher, um, she actually recommended this. She works here a little bit. She was just here the other week and she said, I think it'd be really awesome. This would be something cool you might like because I'm very into theater. So she said, just come try it out. So last year was my first year and I really liked it. So I wanted to come back and it's a lot of fun. I am the stage manager for the stage, so that means I get to pull the curtain, call the show, and I kind of push the kids on stage and help them know where to go and how to do it. And I also am with the other interns, and we just kind of watch them during class, help them with their snack, help them walk around without messing up anything. Uh, at this Kids at Camp, I am uh, with the intern. We move the kids around from place to place, master classes. Uh, this year I actually did a master class with stage movement for them to learn how to move with their characters. 
Um, also to make sure they're listening to their teachers, helping them with um, their script, and making sure they're everyone's okay and accepted. I play Ursula in The Little Mermaid. I heard about kids at camp uh, from uh, the director of this show, uh, Miss Raglan. She was my middle school theater director, and I would believe I was going into um, eighth grade. I heard about the show, and she told me. And so I told my mom, and of course they're very close friends. The two uh, kind of set it up, and that's how I got here. This marks my last year as a camper. I'll be a counselor next year. There's a lot of things I've learned. Um, I never knew how much like movement uh, goes to the character that comes to like little snippets from you. Like I always learned it's like you're like the character, but like every character you have is just a little piece of you. So my first day at the camp, first we introduced ourselves and everybody. We got to meet all the nice mentors, and um, then we had these classes to like help us like prepare for like when we're actually gonna be acting and everything. We had to make up our own stories, we painted. We had couple teachers that taught us um, how to make our own stories and like how to act them out. We all have fun, we all go outside, and sometimes we just talk and then we um, play games to like help us like if we mess up on lines we can just add on and just keep on going without people actually knowing. I started doing theater um, when I lived in Odessa and I came here and my mom just was looking through Facebook and saw it and she told me there's a kids at camp and it asked me if I wanted to go and I said I wanted to go. My role is Jetsum which is Ursula's evil sea spy thing. I've learned what blocking means. I have learned that <laughs> you can be as weird as you want because everyone is weird here and no one should make fun of you. I'm at the theater act camp, and it's a really fun camp, and I am, the, I am a lead, and I play Ariel. Well, the fun thing about Ariel is because I get to act like I am. I am mischievous, I do stuff, and so Ariel, her character is fun, and I love to be fun. And the ch challenging part about being Ariel is you have to put a lot of emotion into it, and so it's like really hard because next thing you know, you're running down steps, and then next thing you have to get to the other part of the stage. So you're doing a lot, and there's a lot of scenes that you have to be in, and it's just a lot of memorization, and so that's so challenging about it. I have learned <laughs> at this camp that there's a lot of movement, there's a lot, there's a lot more like stuff that you have to do in acting than just acting. You have to sing, you have to be able to move stuff, you have to be able to dance, you have to be able to like catch your breath and when you're singing you have to be able to stop, breathe and then sing again. So it's really, it's just like timing and basically just like a lot of movement. I encourage a lot of kids to come to this camp. It's a really fun camp. You do a lot of amazing things. It's a great experience. And I just love this camp because it's awesome. I'm gonna be here next year because it's just a really awesome camp. There's a lot of opportunities and you just learn something that you didn't do before. And it's just like different, I'll say. And the camp director, Miss Teresa, she is really awesome. And if you have a question, just ask her and you'll answer. She'll, you'll get your answer. And it's just a really awesome camp. There's a lot of great people here and I'll guarantee you love it. So for community theater, if you would like to keep up with us, we do have a Facebook group, which is Angelina Community Theater. We also have a web page, which is www.angelinacommunitytheater.org. You can message us there. You can also message us, Angelina Community Theater, at yahoo.com, and we will get back with you. We have our annual meeting coming up this next month. It will be posted on the Facebook group. Everyone's invited to come in. We will be announcing our brand new season, our fourth season uh, here in uh, Lufkin and we would love to have anyone that's interested whether you like to act or if you uh, like to be behind the scenes management helping paint sets helping to construct sets find props if you can so we would love to have you come in and be on board and be a part of our community with the Angelina Community Theater.
here for an hour. And Flag Day celebrates our nation's symbol of unity, a democracy in a republic, and stands for our country's devotion to freedom, to the rule of all, and equal rights for all. At this time, we will recognize the lucky detachment of the Marine Corps League to fold the flag. The symbols of the flag folds of the flag. The first fold is our flag as a symbol of life. The eighth fold is a tribute to the one who enters into the valley of the shadow of death, that we might see the light of day, and to honor our mother for whom it flies on Mother's Day. Constructed in the 1960s, the Georgia Pacific crane that has been a part of the dive ball skyline for the last 55 years is being dismantled to make way for a new, more efficient and modern crane with additional safety technology. For the next six months, work crews will remove sections of the current crane while simultaneously replacing it with a new state-of-the-art cone crane. Once a new cone crane is completely installed and functioning at full capacity, operators will be able to unload log trucks in just one bite. And with its galvanized structure, the crane won't have to be painted throughout its lifetime. Stretching 80 feet in width, 927 feet in length, and 87 feet in total height, the new crane boasts numerous operational improvements, including automatic scales that show the operator the exact weight of a load of logs, cameras that allow the operator to have a 360 degree view of the truck that is being unloaded, state of the art safety controls, increased log storage capacity, lightning protection, and LED lighting for complete visibility. There are also maintenance platforms that are easily accessible and operators will benefit from a heated and cooled cabin. As the current crane comes down, contingent plans to keep the mill running smoothly are in place. Additional equipment to unload log trucks has been purchased. However, during construction, coordination of log deliveries for the facility will be critical due to limited storage space. The cone crane is scheduled to be in full operation by October the 26th of this year. 
The heat has increased dramatically as a proper Texas summer has come into full swing. So we thought it would be appropriate to go over a few summer safety tips. Now, when working outside, don't overexert yourself and be sure to drink plenty of water. And if you start feeling queasy or ill, find a cool place to rest until you get better. Heat exhaustion and heat stroke can be deadly if not taken seriously. When grilling, remember to always maintain your equipment and check gas grills, especially for signs of wear. Even a small gas leak can result in a catastrophe. For charcoal grills, always make sure the spent ashes have completely cooled before disposing of them. Otherwise, you might end up with a trash can fire. If you go out to enjoy the lakes and rivers, it's a good idea to always wear a life jacket. You may be a good swimmer, but it is easy to get in over your head, though no fault of your own. As with any time of year, it's always helpful to keep your own safety in mind. Try to think about how things might go wrong. A little extra caution certainly won't hurt you, and you never know, it might just save your life. I'd like to welcome to the show Jackie Zimmerman. She is the president of the Winneberry Humane Society of Angelina County. And Jackie, thanks for joining us on the show. Thank and you. I know you're relieved because yes. we just finished the major fundraiser for Winnie Berry. Tell me about that. We did. Uh, Dog Days of Summer Golf Tournament. It was it went really, really well. We had a very, very good turnout. We had twenty two teams. Um, we had a great day. Ours is a uh, a very fun tournament. I mean, we add in mulligans, we add in a five iron, we add in throws, and, and for the golfers out there, they know that that's just fun. There's no there's no betting involved, and and so they go out and they have a fun day, uh, feed them lunch, you know, have a good fajita dinner, uh, and and overall, we have a couple of dogs out there, so we we keep our mission at the front and uh, and have a good day. And it was amazing to watch. Um, I helped out with the tournament as well, but it was amaz amazing to watch the people coming back after they had been out wanting to buy a mulligan or a throw. The game just wasn't going as planned, but it was definitely a fun time I had by all. It was definitely yes. hot, uh, so goes the names, dog days of yes. summer. But it, it was still a, a lot of fun and uh, a lot of money raised for a good cause. So tell me a little bit about Winnie Berry Humane Society. Uh, Winnie Berry Humane Society uh, started with by Winnie Berry in the 60s. Uh, we are the only no-kill shelter, uh, and that is our mission uh, is to find homeless pets, forever homes. We also want to educate the community. We're in, you know, our, our big mission is spay and neuter so that we reduce the homeless population of our of, of pets. So uh, we invite people to come out. We have lots and lots of dogs uh, available for adoption. Come out and look. We have lower adoption fees. We also do low spay and neuter for low income. So there's there are a lot of opportunities for people to have pets and, and add that to their family uh, in, in a good way. And, give a homeless pet, you know, adopt, don't shop, give a homeless pet a home. Right. And so in the last um, few months, uh, we've talked about uh, some major rescues that the Humane Society was invo involved in and which skyrocketed the population at the shelter of dogs and cats. Um, since that time, can you give me kind of where the, the shelter is now um, with its animal count? Is it down to a more manageable size? We are down to a more manageable size. We still have more than we normally would have, mm -hmm. um, but we are adopting out, I believe just really this week, we've adopted out six animals in, in the mm -hmm. first three days of this week. Mm -hmm. So they are moving along. Um, our adoptions, we've eased up the way it used to be. It was very difficult mm -hmm. uh, to adopt, but we have really eased up those uh, rules because people need, you know, a pet is such a big part of a family. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we want to make sure that everybody can have a pet you know, um, there are all kinds of dogs at the shelter. You know, we have little bitty dogs, we have some puppies, we have we have a Great Dane. Uh, so that while we still have too many, many more than we would normally have based on the size of our shelter, uh, it is it is going down. People are adopting them and finding, you know, great additions to their family. So we're so really you have excited. A, a more manageable size. And of course, the, the Humane Society um, depends um, it receives some local grant money, but it does not receive any national funding, not any from the Humane Society of America. Um, and this is the major fundraiser. Of course, uh, we'd be remiss not to mention that we have people who continuously yes. give uh, to the Humane Society here, whether it be through a Christmas card gift um, 
or the phantom ball, the phantom ball, or ring and dropping money into a, a, a bucket at in front of Walmart or Sam's or at Whataburger. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's or just going online and giving. You can go online and give. Uh, so the need, even though the, you just had a successful fundraiser, which that money goes into operations, um, you still need. More we're, than that. Yes, we're always in need. You know, there we have we have, we apply for grants. We uh, you know we do a lot of fundraisers. But you're right. There are, there is there is no money coming in from from the city, from the state, from the federal government, from the humane societies of America. Nothing like that. Everything is based on you know these are Angelina County pets, and pretty much Angelina County supports that. And we're really grateful to uh, so many continuous givers. Um, they not only give money, but they also uh, give time, which we're always in need of people who come in and volunteer. Uh, they also give we, you know, food and kitty litter and cleaning supplies and paper towels and newspapers. So they're, you know, um, while we do get people who go through our website and they give on a continuous basis, which is amazing to see, mm-hmm. um, we are welcoming, we, are, we take any kind of donation. Monetary time, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that's important. You know, we've mentioned that on Truths and Tales, our uh, animal show with the City of Lufkin, that it's so important to give those animals human interaction because mm-hmm. when they are put in a an environment and when they're kenneled, um, even though they get to go in and out, you know, they're inside in the evenings and outside during the day. Even though they do have these runs and stuff, if they don't have that human interaction, they their personalities change, and um, you know, and Rightfully so. So it's important to be able to have kids come out and, or not kids. Well, I guess you could, um, a certain age. Yes. Right? I guess they have, I think they're, they're parental. Pre, the, uh, the parents have to be there yeah. up to the age of 16. Yeah. Uh, so I guess you could. Yeah, we've had people come out, uh, young people who come out and do their birthday parties out yes. there. And uh, that's always a great idea. Um, they, uh, they forego their presence and everybody brings dog or cat food or yep. s- something that would benefit the animals at the shelter. Um, they, and then they play with all the animals. And so, uh, it's really a great day for, for those animals. But, um, those dogs are always so excited to, 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 to see to, somebody, to, have, to see somebody and to have some kids pet them and, you know, and throw the ball and just be in there with them. And just that it is, it is amazing. The difference in the, in the dogs and the animals that, uh, that's taken in at Winnie Berry are owner surrenders. Yes. They're not strays. So you see more of these animals who have been in a home for a long period of time, and now they're placed in a kennel for some reason. Uh, maybe that the homeowner had to, is moving and cannot ha- take the dog or the cat. Or sometimes we see that elderly people um, are put into a nursing facility, mm-hmm. and they can, obviously there's no one to take care of their animals. And so you can imagine how the animal feels when it's like, okay, I had this great house and owner, and now I'm in this kennel in a very small kennel yeah. and with no interaction yeah. and no lap to sit on <laughs> right yeah, it's, it's very really difficult um, so that's what we always encourage you just like I said on the city show as well with uh, the, our city shelter here you know adopt 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 there's so many animals and chances are if you're looking for a pedigree you're gonna find it in one of mm-hmm. the local animal organizations so um, well, you also find an animal that is already acclimated to a family, more than likely housebroken. And so they're already ready for a family. So even if a family comes in and have never had a pet before, the pet might have had a family before. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it, it just would, it's just the blending would make it so much better. Right. So your forever uh, new family member is waiting for you at Winnie Berry Humane Society, which is on the West Loop. Uh, if you'd like to see some of the animals available for adoption, you can go out to the website uh, or to Pet Facebook. Harbor, and Pet Finder, Pet Finder and uh, to take a look. Come yes. out. Come take a look at the animals out at the shelter as well. And, um, yeah, find your, your forever friend, right? Yes. And, and I, I would be remiss if we didn't thank Mrs. Grum and Peanut, who every year support uh, the Dog Days of Summer mm-hmm. Tournament. Uh, she is a wonderful lady. She comes out, she brings peanut, and, and it's just an opportunity for, for, for people to see how well received, you know, how, yeah. how supportive she is of, of just animals in general. Um, right. We had several other uh, really big sponsors, 
East Texas Asphalt, Lufkin Coca-Cola, uh, CHI St. Luke's Health, Georgia Pacific. You know, so they they all stepped up. We can always use more sponsors. We can always use, I mean, just as Jan had said before, we always really need more. But um, they have really helped make the tournament and, and the fundraiser successful. Right. And then with uh, Peanut had a friend out there, Brenda Elliott brought Hank. So a lot of people, you know, they support the tournament through their animals. So like Peanut Grum, um, uh, he was our presenting sponsor and uh, did a great job being the presenting sponsor. He came out and met with a guest and did what he was supposed to do. <laughs> so um, anyway, lots of thanks to all those sponsors. Uh, these were our major sponsors, but there were many, many more uh, from this business community and individuals who um, you know, they had a choice where to give their money and they chose the Humane Society and so, so grateful for that. Uh, still need food um, and uh, food. cleaning supplies for the shelter. So if you're thinking, if you're out in the store, you buy an extra bag of dog food if you can afford it and, and bring it to the shelter, that would be greatly appreciated. You know, one time we had 80 something dogs and they go through dog food pretty quick. So yes. um, definitely need to continue that plea for food for the shelter. Absolutely. Those the Great Dane eats a lot of food. The yeah. Big dogs. yeah. Yes, absolutely. With well, Jackie, yes. congratulations on Thank a successful you. tournament. I know you're glad it's behind you. Yes. And, but before we leave, because I know we're going to have her on the show, hopefully next month, is the new executive director for Winnie yes. Berry. Yes, our new executive director is Christy Bice. Uh, she brings a lot of experience with grant writing and running a nonprofit and uh, employee uh, relations. So we're really excited that she can bring, she can take the shelter to the next level. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Jackie, thanks for joining Thank us. You. And uh, we hope to see you out at Winnie Berry uh, getting your new friend. The 2017-18 Leadership Lufkin class is making it more convenient to use the city's transit system. The class recently raised funds and installed covered bus stops at Angelina College and Pilgrim's Pride in Lufkin. The 36th class of Leadership Lufkin cut the ribbon on the covered bus stops, which will keep riders sheltered from the rain, wind, and hot sun. According to class representatives, Angelina College and Pilgrim's Pride were chosen for the project since they serve the majority of the bus riders. Here at the college, especially when we talk to Brazos Transit, this one and the one at Pilgrim's Pride are the most well-used locations. Leadership Lufkin is a nine-month-long program designed to identify and educate the existing and potential leaders of Lufkin and Angelina County. Each month, the class meets and spends the day exploring different aspects of our community, such as health care, education, law enforcement, and more. Through this program, participants have the opportunity to network with local businesses, learn about the area, and find out how they can best utilize their leadership skills within the community. Leadership Lufkin is a project of the Lufkin Angelina County Chamber of Commerce. For more information on Leadership Lufkin, please contact the Lufkin Angelina County Chamber of Commerce at 936-634-6644 or visit their website at lufkintexas.org. The Texas Department of Public Safety has launched its 2018 Click It or Ticket campaign to raise awareness and encourage everyone to wear their seatbelts every time they get into a vehicle. It's not only safer, but it's the law. Everyone in an automobile must wear a seatbelt. We stopped by the kickoff event at Municipal Judge April Early's courtroom in Lufkin to learn more. To help us launch this year's Click It or Ticket campaign, we are joined today by those who support daily the use of seatbelts. Since the Click It or Ticket campaign began, the percentage of people choosing to wear a seatbelt has increased to almost 92% statewide. And because so many more people are buckling up, there are fewer fatalities and serious injuries, a lot fewer. I understand that 9 out of 10 drivers and passengers in our state have gotten a message and choose to use their seat belts, but there are still plenty of drivers and passengers that choose not to wear them, especially at night. Uh, in case you're one of those people, the Lufkin Police Department will be handing out tickets for every seat that is not buckled up. Depending on where you live, a seat belt ticket costs you up to $200 plus fine and court costs. When we see you or one of your passengers without a seat belt or not complying with the child safety seat laws, you may be stopped and issued a ticket. Your safety matters to us. Please save the ticket and just click it during this event this year. Thank you.
If you're already buckling up, great. Make sure that your passengers are buckling up as well. If you don't always buckle up, now's the time to take that opportunity because the odds are on your side. Uh, wearing a seatbelt does reduce the risk of dying in a fatality crash by 45%. One of my first experiences with it as a brand new police officer back in 1985, six area uh, time frame in Houston. I actually was involved in pursuit where the guy I was pursuing, really, really bad guy, uh, actually ran my patrol car several times. Mm -hmm. And thankfully I had my seat belt on because the impacts were to the side of my car and they were to uh, a great extent, enough, a great enough extent that I might have lost control of that car or ended up in the passenger side of the car and not being able to recover as quickly. After that, I told everybody, I said, there's no doubt in my mind, for me personally, wearing a seatbelt's the right thing to do. And I tell everybody this, because I'm actually a trained accident reconstructionist, so I know where very well, and I've worked hundreds of automobile crashes, and I know beyond any doubt, seatbelts save lives. They actually enable people to walk away from wrecks uh, where otherwise they may not have been able to or maybe even died. And I've seen that time and time again. Uh, you'll hear some arguments from people about, well, if I you know, end up upside down in the water, how often does that happen? The, the, the frontal and the side collisions, the rear collisions, those are the ones you see every day. Those are the ones you're most likely to be uh, involved in and they make a huge difference. I personally believe that if I went into a vehicle in the water, I would rather have my seat belt on. And the reason for that is, is that impact, that initial impact with either the far side of a ditch bank or the water itself is gonna be enough that it could, it could either injure you badly or uh, possibly knock you unconscious. And I would rather be able to think my way out of the vehicle than uh, to be unconscious and lose that time. And all the rollover wrecks I've seen where people have been ejected from vehicles, that doesn't end well. In, in a very, very small percentage of the time does it end well for someone who's actually ejected. Uh, the vast majority of the time they suffer, suffer a severe injury or death because the vehicle will roll over on them. And I used to ride a motorcycle years ago yeah. and I would never get on it without a helmet. In fact, I, would, I chose to wear the full face helmet because mm -hmm. I saw a gentleman who had just purchased a motorcycle uh, here in town, as a matter of fact, and uh, I, I didn't know that at the time. Obviously, I was behind him uh, on the Highway 59 in Corrigan, and this gentleman was not experienced. don't know if he had a license or not, or uh, apparently had not been through safety training, and he actually lost control of his motorcycle. He had the open face helmet, older style, and uh, he actually went into the ditch and ended up overending the, the motorcycle uh, when he did. And he, the motorcycle rolled several times. I don't remember how. I'm watching this, mind you. Mm -hmm. And I get there to him, and he has hit his face on the ground. And it actually split his lip all the way to his jawline. Of course, he was still in, in uh, some level of shock and didn't realize it. But I was thinking, that would be a good time to have a full face helmet on. Uh, not just to mention anything that you could hit. Curbs, you name it. Yeah, plenty of things, you bet. So yeah, I advocate uh, helmets at the, at the very least, uh, a helmet of some sort, uh, but even better than that, a full face. In Texas, peaches are the number one deciduous fruit crop. Texans grow more peaches than any other tree fruit crop, but still don't have enough to export out of the state. Locally, I don't know of a peach orchard that still exists within Angelina County. For me and worlds of other folks, a fresh, juicy peach is one of the best fruits out there. According to an article in Horticultural Review, peaches were originally found in modern day China thousands of years ago. Much later, they were a prized fruit in the Roman era and were eventually brought to the Americas by the Spanish in the 16th century. And the State Historical Association states there is a town named Peach in Wood County in Northeast Texas. The settlement was given the name in the late 1800s due to the large number of peach orchards in the area. In 1902, it finally got a post office officially designating it as Peach, Texas. Nothing is left of Peach, Texas today, and today Weatherford lays claim to the Peach capital of Texas. Growing peaches takes a good site. Deep sandy soils that can be found around here are the best. Peaches will not tolerate poorly drained soil and must have a full day of sun to reach maximum production. If the recent rains have left your yard soggy and a mess for a past couple days, then peaches may not take well to your location. Peaches can be grown as a solitary tree since they are self-pollinating. Weed control is crucial in the first couple years after planting. Weeds, 
even the turf grass that you let grow up near the stem, will aggressively compete for water and nutrients. Newly planted trees would benefit tremendously from mulch applied at least three feet on each side away from the trunk to control these weeds. You'll want to give thought to how you'll control the insects and fungal diseases that also frequent peaches. We need to choose a variety that'll work well for our winter weather. On average, we experience 600 chilling hours, but can certainly range from 450 to 750 chilling hours. Make no mistake, a killing late winter frost is enemy number one to a peach tree's ability to bear fruit every year. Chilling hours is a measure of the number of hours that our climate spends between 45 degrees and 32 degrees. There are other science-based measurements of chilling hours, but this range from 32 to 45 degrees Fahrenheit is the most common and I stick with it. Chilling hours is the amount of cool weather that a tree gets before it decides to wake up and bloom. If you planted a tree that requires only 400 chilling hours, then it would likely start blooming much too early, then get hit by a frost, killing the blooms and then not bearing any fruit. The good folks in Houston would do well to plant a peach tree that requires only 400 chilling hours. And on the other hand, if a 800 chilling hour peach tree, that would be perfect in the cooler climate of North Central Texas. If we planted too high a chilling requirement peach, it would never know when to wake up, bloom, and then bear fruit. Trees with too high a chilling requirement are almost always poor bears. One variety to consider is June Gold. It needs 650 chilling hours and is a clean stone fruit. Others to consider include June Prince, Southern Pearl, Tex Royal, Suwannee, Tex Prince, and La Feliciana. Let it be said that while the above list is recommended, it seems that every year a newer variety is available on the market and if the chilling hours works for our climate, you ought to feel free to give it a try. With the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service in Angelina County, this is Kerry Sims. I got it. I'm ready. I've been waiting. <laughs> That's all for this edition of City Hall Update. Thank you for joining us, and we hope you will continue to watch for the latest news and information from Lufkin City Hall. I'm Yana Ogletree. Have a great day.